Uh, I was probably uh, in my like nine or so, and I was the book was um, oh, what's it called the the cat's book by um, T. S. Eliot, and the 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 poem that I was most excited by was about Macavity, the mystery cat. Well, I guess um, the 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 thing about Macavity was that the foster parents of mine said that I was like Macavity, um, uh, and I didn't understand what that meant, but it somehow wedded me to the poem. Um, I guess you know I'm trying I'm trying to look back and find where the moment happened where I fused to the most important thing in my life. Maybe it wasn't my cavity. Maybe it was, you know, while I was in my mum's womb, mm -hmm. um, listening to the noises of the world around me. You know, how do you know where, you know, where you're wedded to this, this, this thing that's greater than yourself? Mm -hmm. I don't. Well, the first poem that I remember writing um, is uh, when I was 14 and I was projecting um, into the future as to what I would be like when I was uh, 16, 17, 18. And I was a very uh, smiley uh, child, and uh, or young person, and, and I projected that I would not be like that that I would be suddenly separate from the crowd in a corner watching people behave uh, in a very sort of introspective manner. And, um, and that sort of became true. All an extrovert is, is an uh, introvert trying to prove that they're not. All an extrovert is is an introvert trying to prove that they're not and therefore you know the smiley person is still and was still absolutely there except he being uh, intelligent and emotionally alive and uh, uh, experiencing the world through his senses there would be a point in his life where he would take a look at the world um, th through through less projecting eyes. You know, a lot of the time as a child, I was smiling so that you smiled back at me. So the, the question that I was asking myself is what happens when I stop trying to make you smile? What happens when I see you rather than uh, try to control you? Yes, there was. There was a teacher called Mr. Unsworth who was a bald-headed, uh, rugby-playing, uh, beer-drinking, um, dedicated English teacher. And uh, I used to show him my poetry uh, and he would uh, critique it and uh, tell me about other poets like Lyndon Quasey Johnson and the like. Um, yeah. So he was my, uh, my, my shining light um, that recognised uh, that I had something. There was also a head teacher who I would describe as being like the clothing designer in The Incredibles. Small teeth, uh, scouser. And she gave me a book by the Liverpool poets called uh, Mersey uh, Beat. And, um, and um, that was published in 1967 originally uh, and um, I received that when I was about uh, 14. She was the deputy head teacher called Mrs Jones and in the first poem by Adrian Henry uh, there is the mention of an orphan or orphanage uh, and being in a children's home at the time, uh, 
that really resonated with me and that entire book did and in fact I presented a, a paper on it at the Poetry Society uh, some years ago. These things are like flags in the mountainside, these moments where people um, uh, catch your light uh, and stay in its beam and, uh, and, and tell you in some way that what you have is of value. Um, um, you know, apples and snakes is another one of those flags in the mountainside. I wasn't mentored, and um, I, I I grabbed each moment of recognition of my creativity uh, with both hands for the seconds that it was there. Um, yeah. Yeah, what I did is, when I left the children's homes at about 17 and a half years of age, the first thing that I did was uh, publish the poems which I had uh, written while I was in care in a small uh, booklet, what would be now known as a chapbook. Um, which was stapled in the middle, and I paid um, the printer, um, uh, a socialist printer in, in Atherton in Lee, and I paid him out of my dole money. I was on the dole for six months. I've never been on the dole since. Uh, and I paid him every week for printing my uh, booklet called Perceptions of the Pen, and then I um, sold that to the... Um, mill workers' families and the mining families of uh, my town and the surrounding towns in Lancashire, 1984. 1984. Do you have them? You still have them? Yes, I do. You do? Oh, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, fantastic. I mean, my poems are like my uh, photo album. Um, they are, uh, um, you know, if all family is, is a set of disputed memories between one group of people over a lifetime, I was fully aware at 17 and a half that I had nobody to dispute the memory of me. Therefore, my poems were like flag, uh, not flags in the mountainside, they were like um, uh, 3D uh, photographs of a time and place where I existed and um, as proof that I existed. And if all family is, is a group of people proving that each other exists over a lifetime, then my poems were my family, so yes, I do have a copy. Mm. Uh, and performing around the country, um, maybe 20, about 20 years of age, I think. Um, and Yeah, Apples and Snakes was very London-centred. Mm. Um, but it, Apples and Snakes really was the beacon for the poet. Uh, it was a place that you aspired to uh, read. You know, it, it was a place where you felt like you had, um, you had developed as an artist your notoriety and your skill had, developed to a point that Apples and Snakes would actually book you. I think um, I, I was always aware that I would be booked by Apples and Snakes at some point. I've been aware throughout my career that, that, um, that there's nothing else that I want to do, there's nothing else that I'm going to do, and uh, and so whoever is in that landscape will at some point know about me. Yeah, find you. Yeah, it, it's never been a question for me. It's never been uh, a worry. You know, I, I write for bigger reasons than any part of any scene. And those reasons are really internal. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I, I don't mean that in an arrogant way. So let's say it is around 1987.
I think it's a little before that. I think it might be 1986. Uh, I remember that Caribbean Focus, I think that was 1987 or 86, it was an, a national uh, promotion of Caribbean literature. And as you can see from that reading in 1987, all of the poets I'm reading with are Caribbean. Okay, so this is really interesting for me because at that time there were no uh, African birth poets. They were all Caribbean poets. It was the Caribbean poets who laid the groundwork for my entire career. And, and I, re I was aware at the time of having to wait for a generation or so for a generation of a second generation African born poets to arise. At that time, there was me and Jackie Kay. Uh, and both of us were from uh, Afro Caribbean, uh, African backgrounds. Uh, though both of us were brought through the care system in one way, shape or form. Um, Jackie through adoption and me through uh, fostering and children's homes, which is interesting. It's an interesting fact. We had to wait a long time, uh, not that we were waiting, um, for those, uh, those African second generation poets to emerge. The reason we emerged is because we weren't second generation, we were first generation in that we were adopted or fostered or brought into the care system. It's very interesting for me, uh, and it's really good that you have record of uh, that. In fact, ja Jackie uh, was publishing at the time, uh, but not in her sole collection, which was the adoption papers, which came out in 1992 via Blood Axe Books. My book came out in 1988 with Bogle Overture. So you booked me before I was published uh, in my first collection uh, and uh, my first double page in the Guardian newspaper was at 21 years of age as well, so, yeah. The audiences were, yeah, kind of really mixed. Um, and they were there for the poetry and they were there for the sense. They were there, they were there really, I think, to be excited by the vitality of hearing a poet read live. And especially myself of hearing, you know, I always got the sense from the audiences when I was here that I was a new arrival and that they wanted me to just to be me as much as I could. So I got a real kick out of performing in London with at, at Apples and Snakes gigs. I really did, it was really beautiful, like I was, one speedy, angry, funny, um, uh, guy, you know, and uh, who wrote poetry, you know, who believed in what he did and did what he believed, who loved what he did and did what he loved, and, and where better to display that than at the number one kind of place in the country for performance and for poetry. I've never called myself a performance poet and I've never believed myself to be as such, but um, I, do, uh, I do inhabit my poems, or they inhabit me, and then, you know, when we're on stage, they, uh, they, uh, they become themselves, you know. They, they walk out to the audience, you know, and they look everybody in the eye and they raise an eyebrow and they shout and um, yeah, they're, they're, yeah, they learn. yeah they, they, what it's like is like when you're writing you're making dynamite uh, and you've, y y you're making all the different ingredients for this dynamite that's going to make a, a firework and then all you do when you go on stage is light the touch paper and then watch the firework display and it can be like a Catherine wheel, it can be one of those that goes right on like a flower, it can be like a all white, you know, like beautiful array of light, it can be uh, scary, can, you know, all of those things. And you don't totally know what the ingredients, the balance of the ingredients were, but you know that you did them very specifically on your own. You know, a gig is a firework display, but the magic is in the laboratory where the writer is totally alone creating this fine 
substance. I think nerves is like a tuning fork. It, you, you, know, you, you, you hit the tuning fork and it, it vibrates on a really kind of uh, minute level and the vibration goes up the forks and they make this perfect pitch sound to which all of the sounds are compared to get that pitch. So nerves are a way of finding perfect pitch. It's really good to be able to tell yourself what nerves are. Nerves are the acknowledgement that it happened, that it matters. Uh, nerves are a, a, a need to prove oneself first and foremost to yourself because when you're nervous, you're often alone backstage. You're not with lots of other people. So the nerves is about you and that's okay. So it's only you who can, who can, who can marshal those nerves to become the performance. I, uh, uh, what I want when I do a gig uh, is I want the person who comes on before me to be incredible, like mind-blowingly incredible. Because what they do when they, when they are incredible, if they come on before you, is that they raise all of the senses in the audience. All of the audience is thinking, my God, that was amazing. And the, the, the MC is thinking, wow, this is a good gig. How's Lem going to do? I, I'm in competition with nobody. And I never have been. I have to be as best as I can be. You know, so uh, that's the first thing to say about performance and about whenever you come on stage. The Caribbean poets I have great love for. So the Fred de Guas, Jean Binterbreeze, John Agars, James Berry, Grace Nichols, etc. Um, I just have a lot of love because they've given me so much. Um, there's nobody I don't like performing with, um, really. I, I don't really think about that. I, you know, I, I know a lot of people will, will put on their CV, they'll say, you know, oh, performed with X, Y, Z. It really doesn't matter. You know, it's really important that you do what you do. I, it, it, I don't know whether it's cool to say, I've performed with, you know. Um, yeah, you can define a poet's career by the work they turn down more than the work they take. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Wow, that's not so long ago, really. I mean, yeah, there's Lem's to say Special Source was a series of gigs I did in Manchester, and then uh, Apples and Snakes did them in London. Uh, yeah, I'll never forget that, actually, because Michael Rosen did mine at Battersea Arts Centre, and it was quite beautiful, but I, I had a new agent and she was drunk and she, she cornered Michael and she was just ranting at him and I, I, really, I was really not happy about her doing that. And anyway, yeah, yeah, no, it was a beautiful thing, yeah, yeah. Just to show, yeah, it's to bring artists coming up but also to show artists that I really liked. It's funny, you know, in every poet's career, if you're a poet for life, um, you, go, you can go through times where you suddenly feel irrelevant or you suddenly feel like um, people don't see you. And, um, or you just feel down, you know, for a, a year, six months, you feel, you know, you, it's right that you should go through that um, experience. And most uh, poets that I know and respect have gone through it. You know, uh, Brian Patton took a year off once and went to Spain. Um, I'm sure Michael has been there as well. Um, and uh, that's why I booked him, because I think he's incredible. I'm not dependent on an artist being visible for me to love what they do. I don't need to, they don't need to be the hot thing that week. And uh, yeah, it's great to see, you know, uh, the greatest examples of how to be as a poet are all out there. All we've got to do is look. If you watch the Liverpool poets, if you look at Benjamin and Linton and um, Grace Nichols and John Agard and poets who live as poets and love as poets, um, you know, the examples of how to be in this industry 
are all out there to be studied. It's funny, when new poets come on the scene, you know, they often feel, not always, but often feel as if they are creating uh, a reality. And the truth is, is that it's been done before by lots of other quite incredible human beings who are still doing it. So look at them. Look at how they live their lives. Look at what their lives are, etc., etc. And it's, all the examples are out there for all of us. I've always looked. I've always looked. The internet is the biggest explosion of words and communication between human beings uh, in my entire lifetime. I was born 1967. Uh, 65, 66, 67, there was an explosion of literature, of performative poetry uh, in America and in, in uh, England. The two often have a very strong and powerful relationship regarding culture, song and poetry. Uh, so what we had here was the Liverpool poets. What we had in America uh, in the, in the mid-60s was the beat poets who'd come out of the 50s, Lawrence Ferlinghetti, Allen Ginsberg, who were incredibly performative. Uh, and what we had in the uh, mid-60s here was everything from the literature of Ted Hughes, the beginnings of Sylvia Plath, the literature of Adrian Mitchell, um, a, a, um, uh, Hor Michael Horowitz, etc., who, you know, it's, it is noted that in 1965 there was the performance at the Royal Albert Hall, filled the Royal Albert Hall now with poetry. Now, um, that's the significance of poetry in public spaces at that time. That's when Arvon started, the Arvon courses that are now all over the country in 1967. Uh, that's when uh, Poetry International was started, which is the International Poetry Festival at the, uh, at the South Bank Centre. Um, and now what I'm saying is that it is bigger now than it was then for the first time in my life. So uh, we are at a very, very exciting time at the moment. If you put on top of that slam poetry, which began in, um, uh, I don't know when it began, I think it was 1990 something or other, it's a very particular time, and it happens, began in Chicago. Um, um, if you add that phenomenon, which has is, which is spread across the world, uh, of which I have a lot to say, um, then, then we, are, we are living in the most exciting time in poetry in uh, this century and the previous century. It's very exciting. To say that I don't like slam is to probably dismiss all of the incredible poets that have actually uh, sort of flown from the slam scene. But I will say um, that um, slam poetry was established in the same year of the Gulf War. And every war has given rise to poets who would rail against it. Um, in the 1960s is a great example. Adrian Mitchell read a poem about Vietnam at the Albert Hall. I think slam poetry um, came into the house of, of poetry and um, and rearranged the priorities of what poetry is. Rearrange the priorities. And let me just give you an example of what the priorities are in poetry and what slam poetry said the priorities are. Let me also give you an example of how to build an ivory tower by blaming other people's ivory towers. So it's this. First, um, the root of poetry is in... Um, the poet's belief in poetry and belief in their poetry and belief in their creative spirit. From that root, uh, you grow a sense of critique, but the critique can only grow with care and attention. You know, you don't just throw a plant in the ground and go, right, grow, and if you're bad, forget you. So that's a really tender process of which the writer has to sort of harden. You have to go out in all weathers, 
you know, to tend this beautiful thing, the poem, the creativity, and you have to allow it to grow in the way it'll grow. Some arms will grow radical, some arms will grow inside, some, you know, branches, you know, will grow up to the light, some of them will go down to the roots, whatever, let it grow and tend to it. What slam poetry did was said, okay, stand in front of an audience, and if they tell you that you're good, then you're good, but if they tell you you're not, you're not. That's like everybody standing around the plant and saying, this is not a good plant, this is a weed. Let's take this weed out so that a good plant can grow. And, um, and the nature of neoliberalism is that, <laughs> is that uh, oh no, I don't wanna, yeah, yeah. Is that the market forces become more important almost than the product. So what slam poetry did is said the true value of your worth, plant, is not in the miraculous uniqueness of what you're doing. It's in whether they tell you that you're good or not. And that is an incredible lie to what is the immense power of the truth of what poetry is actually all about. You know, I'm not really concerned whether or not you like my poetry. I'm concerned that I'm writing and I'm growing as a creative being. This will serve me forever. You won't. You will go. This, this interview will be over. You know, so, so I can't be defined as to whether you like me or not. Now, a lot of the time in my career, people would be saying to me, that's really arrogant, Lemon, and it's not actually, that's the most humble, a place for me. You, a person can never say that they are humble because that's not humble. But, but but what I'm trying to say is that is that I am the poem is the queen, the queen, and I'm its dresser, and I sit at its throne by its throne, dressing it and making sure, as best as I can do, that the threads are right, and then I just watch it walk out in front of an audience. I'm like. God, I missed that bit. This is the development of the artist's critique. This is the heart of what it is to be an artist. Am I looking out at you all and saying, please tell me whether, whether what I've done is good or not? This is really important because what this means is that in slam poetry, there is quite the possibility that number one, we have lost an entire generation of poets. And number... Um, Number two, the priorities were always wrong. Now, that's the first point. To set up this idea, what you must do is accuse an ivory tower of keeping you out. Before you build an ivory tower yourself, you must find an ivory tower that you feel you've been kept out of. Now, this is tricky because there are gatekeepers and there are people who say you're not allowed in. Uh, and they are in poetry just as much as they're in football, just as much as they're in any other department of our blah. But as a poet, you cannot be defined by what you're against. You must be defined by what you're for. And that, for me, for me, that is the creative spirit to go wherever it wants to. Immediately, what happened with slam poetry, right at the beginning, was a particular kinds of poetry would win the slam poetry blow, and particular kinds of poetry wouldn't. Hey, there's your ivory tower, already being built, the foundation is there, so what do you get? You get Tong Fu, you get uh, Bangs at the Gun, you get blah, 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 you get all of these incredible, incredible bursts of momentum to make an event happen where there is poetry, but at the same time, it shoots itself in the foot by deciding who is best and who is not via an audience. Now, I, I know that those places that I mentioned, Banks of the Gun and Tong Fu, actually do great stuff for poetry, for people to get on stage, aside from slam. But my, my contention is this, they would have been there anyway. What is the first thing a poet does when they've done a slam? 
stop doing slams. A slam is there primarily for the organisation that's holding the slam. And a gig should always be there primarily because they want to put on the poets. So this has been a very tricky narrative for me to communicate because at the same time as slam poetry happening, I'm realising, oh, I'm, a, I'm the older generation now. And this is the younger generation. So when I saw Brian Patton, I said to him, Brian, like, you know, uh, what, what is happening? Because this thing is happening and they don't know about the Caribbean poets that came before, that laid the ground, that did, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And, um, and I realised, and, and what he said, he said, yeah, hey, Lem, they're just, they're just cleaning out the rabbit hutch, Lem. And I thought, wow, what a beautiful thing, because what is happening with the slam poetry generation is what happened with the 60s generation. That's what Brian Patton did as the Liverpool poets in 1967. You know, that's what Michael Horovich did at the, at the Blan, and actually they've done throughout their career, you know, they clean up Rabbi Hodge. And um, so I've always felt um, to take it with a pinch of salt, because I am getting older, and, um, and, and, and the same thing happens, and that is that whether it's slam poetry, whether it's beat poetry, whether it's jazz poetry, you get these poets of every generation, whether it's punk poetry, Attila the Stockbroker and various other jewels, you get these poets who, 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 who regardless, regardless, just shoot up like fireworks and then just, just spread light in the middle of the air and from that light, new shoots grow, new shoots grow, new shoots grow. You know, Kate Tempest, you know, Luke Wright, you know, all of them, all of them spread light. And that light shines on people who want to do it as well. You don't have to be successful as a poet. Poetry can serve you through your teens. It can serve you through your divorce. It can serve you through your depression. You can get up on stage and, and, and at an Apples and Snakes gig as a depressed human being and feel a sense of self, a sense of bridge between one time and another and that's okay if poetry if that's all it did that's you know that's as good as me having a full lifetime career in poetry that's as good as that poetry is that powerful and I sometimes think that the judging of a poem out of ten reduces what it is to be a poet or to be creative. We have to fight back. The last poets and Gil Scott Heron have been a quite big influence on me by watching them as an example of how to be, really. Um, both of them have gone through quite dark periods within their careers where they felt they were irrelevant at times. Uh, I know them all. I've made documentaries with Gil and I've made documentaries with The Last Poets um, uh, and about them um, for the BBC. And um, yeah, we are in conversation with uh, America consistently. Um, I'll be in New York in a couple of days' time reading a uh, right in the middle of Harlem, I'll be in Washington DC and uh, we, have, we have a very powerful conversation in the development of poetry um, with America and that's no bad thing. Um, uh, what's great about here in particular is that when the poets are less popular in America and are like, like Gill virtually on the streets, uh, we, still, we, we still have time for them here. It's the same the other way around as well, you know. So there is a, there's a kind of a beautiful relationship between live poetry in America and live poetry here. The Saul Williams of America and the George the Poets of here, you know. 
Um, and it goes right back, you know, Sylvia Plath, American, uh, T.S. Eliot, you know, the relationship on the page and in performance is good. I want to say this about performance and the page, is that actually the truth for me is that um, my relationship with the poem when I'm on my own uh, is so intense that when I perform on stage, you get a very small percentage of the intensity of the time when I'm alone with the poem. I don't believe that I perform. I, I, you know, from the beginning of my career, I have had people call me a performance poet, um, and I get why, and it does make sense. You know, I'm, I'm kind of okay with that. But the truth is, is that most of us write alone, with this incredible liquid um, that's caught in a straw and teased out through a piece of metal, a perfect circle inside a little lip that's holding it. And that metal spins around and pulls down this liquid so in such a way that it doesn't drip, it just coats the ball. And we chase that along a piece of paper on our own to make things that were never before there. Mm -hmm. You know, what is this building if it was not imagined? You know, what is the things that come from poems are come from a time which is, which is thinner than the space between that ball and the ink that, that, that circles around it. You know, that intense relationship is really got nothing to do with anybody else except for the artist, the paper, the pen, the fluid, and the circling ball, which is going down thousands of times a second as he races or she races, traces it along the paper. That, that relationship is so um, precious and throwaway <laughs> um, that it's very difficult for me to think of when I take that out to an audience and they it's called performance poetry. I think, wow, you weren't there. You know, I, I, I know it's natural to call it performance poetry and that's okay. And I know I freaking love an audience. <laughs>